Welcome to Make Life Fun. I'm your host, Josie Wheatman, founder of Backroads Coaching, where we pave our own path to self-acceptance. Think of me as your self-love bestie, here to guide you, support you as you let go, rewrite the thoughts and beliefs that are blocking you from loving yourself and living your best life. This season, we are talking business, pleasure, love, money, and of course, all things motherhood. This is a sponsored episode by Regila Beauty. As women, our skincare needs are constantly evolving and changing, so it can get a little confusing when we need a new item to fit into our existing skincare routine to tackle new issues. Regila Beauty has a wide variety of items that are built to fit into your routine, whether you have youthful skin, mature skin, you're expecting, or you're even a new mama. If I told you that you could enjoy these benefits without the inconvenience or expense of changing your current skincare routine, but just by adding something wonderful and affordable to it. Skin that looks and feels more even-toned, firmer, hydrated, radiant, smoother, smaller pores. Well, Regila Beauty has the Hydrating Serum, and it is that something wonderful that I'm speaking of. It is perfect for busy moms at any stage of motherhood, whether you're trying to conceive, currently pregnant, nursing, or preparing for an empty nest. Our serum is the clean beauty, fuss-free add-in you've been looking for. It's formulated to be non-irritating for even the most sensitive skin. It's full of beautifying botanicals featuring hyaluronic acid, niacinamide, and vitamin C, the ultimate anti-aging trifecta. It sinks right into your skin effortlessly between your current toner, moisturizer, without feeling greasy or sticky. It's unscented and also free of toxic ingredients that could harm your health. Get it today by visiting Regila's Amazon shop at amazon.com slash Regila, R-E-J-A-L-L-A, or click the link in the description box now. That's a big question because I've not lived that experience myself. I have not been in the experience where my truth is not seen by the general public. Like people can't see my truth. Like I feel like people can relate with my truth, like our truth of being like I'm a woman in a woman's body versus somebody who doesn't, who identifies as a woman and isn't in a woman body having their truth. Right. And so that's when the story comes in. So that's when the, the story that we have to, we have to learn to drop. And the story is we have to drop it for ourselves because it's not the other person that we can't change another person at all. We can't put our beliefs on them. We can't make them be a certain way. The only thing that we can do is change the way we are going to believe something about ourselves. So let's say for self-concept, I am focusing on bringing in this million dollars. And my self-concept is I don't think I'm good with money. I don't think I'm worthy to have money. People with money are greedy. People with money are this or that. Like, how is that self-concept going to get me what I want? It's not. So I have to unpack it every day, day by day, little by little, to be the person who is walking with a million dollars, thinking that it's great to work with a large sum of money. I love having money. Money feels good. Money holds me. Money supports me. Money makes my life better and the world of the world better. Money is here for me. I use it for good. Like it's a whole different belief system in that concept. So same thing when you are looking at yourself in that self-concept, you have to look for yourself what it is that you want to see versus of what you don't want to see. You have to shift the focus. And so when we're looking at somebody and we're projecting onto them, we're projecting onto them, let's just say like that person is really anxious today. That person is really, really anxious. What we're really saying is I'm really anxious. So what is it in me? Can I change? What is it in me? Can I highlight? Can I shine a light on that will help me be less anxious? Because it's not, it's never about the other person. It's always about you, like no matter what you see. All day long, people are opposing what they think, feel, and believe on other people because it's the way we've been programmed. It's how we've been brought up. It's just the norm. Like even as a child, your parents are doing that to you all day long. And you are taught from it from such a small age that as you grow, it's just the natural, normal thing to do. Like it is not natural. It is not normal to look at yourself when you see something bad in the world and say, how am I contributing? That 
is a very, I think they say 3% of people are working actively on themselves. That's a very small percentage of people that are doing the work of trying to shine the light of goodness and make the world a better place by changing themselves first. And so people are going to project and that is completely okay. They're allowed to, we can witness them, but when we're doing the work, we look to find in ourselves what we see outwardly. And we start with ourselves because when you're that goodness in the world, haven't you noticed when you walk into a room, it can be feeling so heavy, but if you're high on cloud nine, feeling good, smiling, dancing, singing, what happens? The moment you walk in the room, it's like a, it's like a light just goes through the room. And so it's the same thing. So when we do the work, we're helping all those people that aren't doing the work. Yeah, I definitely help people of all ages. And I've worked with both men and women at this point. And everybody comes with their own baggage. That's the only way to put it is everybody comes with their own beliefs, their own baggage. And no two people are ever going to be the same. No two wants are the same. No two desires are the same. And so every time you do the work, it's for you, for yourself. And it's not going to look the same for the person sitting next to you. And that's okay. And the work can look like simply doing a meditation, like a visualization. The work can look like, I believe this. And how does it make me feel? The work can look like, I really want this, but I'm not getting this. But these are the steps that I know that's going to get me there. Like the work for everybody is different. It's never going to be the same for two different people. Like I said earlier in the show, like sometimes my work is working with little Josie. Sometimes my work is working with teenage Josie. And sometimes my work is working with the woman I'm becoming now. So it looks different in every different season of your life. And what you focus on is what grows. So what you're trying to, we have what you're trying to amplify is where you need to focus. But what I've learned is it needs to be playful focus. It needs to be soft. It needs to feel good because we're not going to do it unless it feels good. And unless we want to, I am very determined. I am very focused. And when I want something, I go after it and I put my nose down and I just go for it. But what I've learned is that it's not that joyful. We're supposed to be here for the journey. Life is supposed to be fun. And life is not fun when you're so, so focused to the point where you shut everything else out. And so what I mean by playful focus and soft focus is allowing the journey to unfold, allowing the journey to be light so it doesn't have to feel so heavy. Like you get to still do the work, but find the joy along the way. Yeah, meditation practice that is going to bring you into your body. Like that's the greatest, greatest place to be is in your body. So focusing right now on your breath. And as you take a breath, you will notice that your belly rises and then you're focusing on bringing the breath out. And we're going to take a breath in, breath out, again, a breath in and a breath out. And we're just going to start to focus on our body. So what we're doing right now, not changing anything at the moment, just focusing, like, is your legs crossed? Is your legs uncrossed? The surface you're sitting on, is it soft or is it hard? Mm. Just being the witness, just seeing and observing, not changing anything. And if I were to ask you to make yourself just like 5% more comfortable, what would you do? What would feel comfortable for you? If you could put your palms on your, your hands on your lap, you can put your palms up or your palms down. Just get yourself a little bit more comfortable. Now we're going to drop into the body. So start to notice the length of yourself. So from the top of your head to the bottom of your feet, not changing anything here, just paying attention. And the length of our body is where we are self-esteem. It's how we hold ourselves. It's how we see ourselves in the world. This is our self-concept. This is where we can start to either feel confident or not confident feel ready or not ready. And then we're going to move to our, the width of our body. So shoulder to shoulder, side to side, just noticing, noticing if there's any sensation and our width of our body is where we are either open or closed off, where we allow ourselves to invite people in, where we invite boundaries. And then as we move into our back body, our back body is where our past lives. And most of the time we're so forward focused that we don't come back here. So we're going to take a moment back here in your back body. And we're just going to notice if we feel any tightness, any sensation with no judgment, we're just going to send some loving breath to your back body. 
And today, what we're going to do is we're going to send some gratitude. Gratitude to the person that you've become, but also the gratitude to the person that was before this, that helped you get here. All the small and big transitions, all the small and big moves and shifts and action steps all the ways that you showed up for yourself in each chapter, in each moment. And we're just gonna acknowledge it for a second. We're gonna acknowledge you, you for showing up for yourself, for showing up for the assignment that is you, your life. And as we move through to the front body, which is where we are most of the time, forward moving, we're in motion, we're looking to the future, we have that goal, we see it, and we're moving towards it. Ask yourself, are you allowing yourself to be pulled in that direction? Or are you finding yourself being pushed in that direction? And as that answer comes up for you, don't judge it. Just take it as the witness. Just take it as is. And as you come here now to your present moment, back focusing on the breath, in and out, we're going to drop to our center of gravity, which is right underneath your belly button. And we're going to ask this simple question of what is it that I intend for myself today? What is it do I want today? And we're going to allow that to anchor us here. This is your commitment to self. And whenever you are ready, I'm going to have you start to move your body a little bit and start to just come back into the room that you're in. When you're ready, you can open your eyes. And for everybody, that experience is going to be different, different sensations, different emotions, different thoughts are going to come up for you. That's what you get to unpack. Like when you work with me, we go through these practices and no two is ever the same. It's always what is in the moment, but those beliefs that come up for you, the thoughts that come up for you, like those, that's where the work is because that's the truth. When you're that dropped in, that's the truth. I've been tapping now for, I would say about five years when I really found tapping and tapping is using the different meridians on your body, which is the pressure points to release and let go, which we need that. We need that help sometimes of tangibly saying what we need to say and tapping on our meridians. And so when something is triggering, something that triggers you, tapping instantly will help you start to release that. And so let's say you have this belief and you just can't shake it. You've done the mindset work, you've done the embodiment and it's still not working. You need something else. I mean, tapping is a really beautiful way to give voice to what you're feeling. So you state the truth of what is true for you. So that is the truth. That is what you feel. That is what you believe. And then you invite your body to see it a new way. So after you acknowledge it, after you sit with it, after you allow it to move through you, then you're able to see if your body is willing to open up, willing to release just a little bit and a little bit. And the more you do the tapping, the more your body is able to release these tensions that are in your body, the construction that's in your body. And that's when the mindset and the embodiment, they come together because now you have this new mindset, this new belief, this new way of being, but not only is it just in your head, now it's in your body. You're teaching your body how to relax. You're teaching your body how to release. You're teaching your body how to feel good ultimately with your new belief. And so in my coaching practice, the client is the lead. I am here to hold the space as you do the work that's best for you. So journaling has been very powerful for me, like writing things down, putting pen to paper. I believe that's the way of bringing things to the physical world. That is my way of manifesting. That is my way of anchoring in. And also my way of knowing that change has even occurred. Because what happens when you are doing this work that your life just starts to change and it becomes to feel like the norm, which is beautiful. But then you forget where you even were a month ago, because it's just, you just now are living, breathing it, you've become it. And so journaling is a really beautiful thing to just even look back at your progression of how far you have come, but not everybody loves journaling. For some people, it's drawing. Some people really just love drawing out things and that's their way of, of manifesting and putting pen to paper, but it has to be something that feels good for you. 
Like if it doesn't feel good for you, you're not going to do it. There was a season in my life I didn't journal because I was going through a really hard chapter in my life and I didn't want to document it because I noticed every time I put pen to paper, it was just ranting and complaining. And then I would read it, which I shouldn't have done, but I did for some reason. I, I mean, when you're in pain, you want more pain because we're conditioned for that. And so then I stopped journaling. And so for a whole year, I didn't journal because it wasn't what I needed. I tapped. And that was my way of processing and working through. And so for everyone, it's going to look different each season, what works for you. And so for some season, journaling is going to be great. And for other seasons, yeah, you're going to put it away and and it's not going to be what you focus on. And that's okay. So when you become, I call it being awake. When you become awakened to the truth of who you are, awaken to that there is a better way of being there's a better way of reacting and there's a better way of showing up in the world and there is uh, you are your higher self now you will notice out in the world when you don't see that when you see people not living that way and we put it upon ourselves at least for me and some of my clients to try to change everybody else we want now we have been awakened and we want everybody else to be awake we want everybody else on this journey because it's so life-giving. It's so amazing. Like, join me here. But not everybody is ready to join us. And like I said, 3% of people are actively working on their personal development. That's it. And so that is when we turn to ourselves. Like what we see in the world, that is our, that is the work that we get to do for ourselves. Like what is irritating us, we get to bring it to ourselves and we get to being curious about how it's showing up for us in our life. And then we change our life. And by changing your life, you give others the permission to do the same. And so only when they're ready, will they ever step into this. People do not come to this by being pushed, shoved, forced. It has to be a willing, a willing thing. And a lot of people, what they do is they wait until they hit rock bottom. Like yesterday, I read this quote that says like, we find at the bottom of the well is where we find wisdom. So when we're fully at rock bottom, that is where the, we're like, we're willing to look for it. Like we're willing to say, I need help. But when everything is going fine and we're in our comfort zone and the day-to-day -day life, we're just fine. We're fine living life that way because we've done it for so long that we're not going to change because why change it? If it, what, isn't that the quote? If it ain't broken, why fix it? And so it takes sometimes radical things in life for us to change. And so we can't just go to somebody and be like, this is going to be great. You got to change. They have to be ready. And so what we can do is take what we see in others and figure out how we can change ourselves to be a better, a better beacon in the world, to be the light in the world, to, to help ourselves. Because I know it seems so counterproductive to think that we have to go first. We have to do the work for ourselves because we really, especially as moms, we will do things all day for our kids. We'll do whatever it takes to give them the best life. But for ourselves, we think we're being selfish, but really truly it's that oxygen mask. When you change, when you do the work for yourself, you can't help but influence others to wanna to do it themselves because they see your transformation. They're witnessing it. And that's the best work you can do is do the work for yourself so that you can in turn help your people or the people of the world. They are our teachers. So the people we live with that aren't on the journey with us, they are our best teachers because they teach us boundaries. They teach us to set healthy boundaries. They teach us to voice what we need. They teach us so much if we allow them to be our teachers instead of our aggressors. <laughs> like so much of the time we want to say, because you are doing this, I am feeling this way. But no one has the power to make you feel a certain way without your permission. And I know that doesn't sound right, but it is 100% true. You are in control. You're the voice. You are the president of you, the CEO of you. And so you have to learn to say what you need to say and give yourself boundaries. And that's what the people that we love the most do for us. They get to teach us how to, to love more, be more compassionate. And confidence is not something that you are born with. You don't just say, I'm confident. No, it's something that you grow into by getting to know yourself. The more you get to know yourself, the more you get to be confident. The more you know, you know what? I know that I am worthy. Like you come to this knowing that I am worthy. 
And I, I am not an imposter because for a lot of my clients, that is the thing that we are working with the most is that imposter syndrome. It's feeling like a fraud, feeling not good enough, feeling not qualified. And so the sooner that we can start to unpack those beliefs and get to know yourself, the sooner you can get to the place of where you are more confident because you no longer are a person that believes that you're an imposter. You don't have value. You're not good enough. You believe I'm a person of value. I'm a person of worth. What I have to say matters. My voice matters. That's a whole different energy. I truly believe anybody can be helped, but there has to be a willingness. You can bring what they say, a horse to water, but you can't make the horse drink. And so you can't save people. And I know this from personal experience of just my innate way of wanting as the oldest in my family is I want, I wanted to save everybody. I wanted everybody to be okay. And so I kept thinking I could do that. But what I'm learning is I can only save myself. And by me saving myself, I can impact so many people, including the people I love the most. On the fence, the self-help. I think if you're listening to this podcast, I wouldn't say that you're off the fence to self-help because I've been dropping lots of wisdom and the listener and the guests too have been dropping so much wisdom. But if there is somebody out there that is on the point where they know they want to step into this self-help world and they know that they want to, to better themselves, I would say pick up a book. That's the easiest way to start is just read about it or get on YouTube and whatever it is that you are feeling in the moment that you need to know you need help with like we're in a place where only way you do not know something is because you don't want to know it if you want to know it the information is there for you and it's just up to you whether or not you want to look for it yeah that was the biggest catalyst for me to stop dabbling in my self-help and really invest in my self-help and really invest big dollars like as some of you know I just went to this retreat and it was it was not cheap. And I paid it willingly, gladly, because I knew the transformation on the other side was not only going to benefit me, but it was going to benefit my husband and my child. And when we are in a place of loving ourselves, because that's really what self-help is. Self-help is learning to love and accept yourself. And so when we're in that place of being able to accept ourselves, love ourselves, we can't help but be compassionate and loving towards others in their messy middle. And so our children are in their messy middle every single day. They are learning new things. They're trying new things. They're so curious that we need to hold that level of compassion for them. And so truly believe that if we can't hold that level of compassion for ourselves, we can't do it for somebody else. And so what I found is I am so able to hold Everett's everything. Like I am so just like here for it all. And sometimes I'll see him with other people and I could instantly tell they could strip because they're like, it's too much. His energy is too much. Like, how can I handle this energy? But it's because they can't handle their own energy. They can't handle their own tantrums. So why would they be able to help my son? So if I've witnessed that time and time again. And that's just true to tell that if you do the work for yourself, you're not just doing it for you. You're doing it for everybody else, including the person that you love the most, which is your sweet little angel, your little child, even if they're little or big, or you're still helping them because you're putting the mindset on them that they too can learn to be that compassionate human being. Like you're not putting your beliefs that aren't true on them, like true with a lowercase T, like there's the truth. And then there's the truth, which is your truth, which is, is it really So the work is, I mean, the best thing you'll ever do in your parenting is examining your beliefs, examining your emotions, learning to live in the present moment here and now is the best thing you'll ever do for yourself. Well, my boundaries for my child is that they're just non-negotiable things. Like his nap is non-negotiable. If I'm around a person that makes me feel uncomfortable, I know that makes, that's non-negotiable for my son. So I just don't put him in situations I would never put him in situations that are uncomfortable because I've learned to set boundaries for myself. So putting boundaries up for him, like if it's his nap time and somebody wants to go do something, that's a boundary that I'm willing to make. That's a sacrifice I'm willing to make because I know the outcome of it. And so when you learn to set boundaries for yourself, you can definitely set boundaries for your child. I think you just have to use your discernment to how And what you could say to your kids at what age you can say it, because 
they don't know and they don't have the filter of knowing. And so you have to be, you have to use their discernment. But I also believe there is a, there is something to telling the truth to your kids because the truth I believe sets us free. The best way I heard it was that our kids, like we're setting them up to be little humans in the world. Like that's basically what we're doing. We're setting them up to be humans in the world. And so it's our responsibility to teach them all the things they need to know to be the best they can be in the world. And so some of the things we have to tell them aren't pretty. Like the truth sometimes isn't pretty. And so we just have to do it. And we have to do it from a place of like non-judgment, clear, focused truth with a capital T. Because otherwise, then we're putting our filter on it. And that's when it gets weird for our kids. I think we can speak until we're blue in the face to our kids. And it's not, I mean, it might make a a little bit of difference, but I truly believe that what we do speaks volume versus what we say. We have to become so aware of what we're doing. Thank you for being part of the self-love movement. Your support and care matters here. Please be sure to subscribe, review, and share. And get your ultimate daily planner freebie today by visiting makewifefunpodcast.com. When you're ready to step deeper into my vibration and work together, go to backrosecoaching.com. Thank you again for listening. See you next time.